the creative bit is the bit that we all get out of bed for in the mornings, developing those products or the yeah. packaging design or whatever it happens to be. But landing something on shelf is so complicated, involves so many different people. The process is probably the bit that gets everybody bogged down. So I wish there was a magic button that just made all that stuff kind of happen. And maybe one day there will be. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's a necessity of landing things right first time. Uh, today, I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by Emma Beale, uh, Head of Product Innovation at Waitrose. Emma, welcome to the Innovate podcast. How are you today? Well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. Um, I think, it's, is it fair to say, given the level of innovation at Waitrose, that you've probably got one of the best innovation roles in the food industry anywhere? Would that be a fair, a fair statement, yeah. do you think? Yeah, I'm I think I'm pretty lucky. I think um, when we met uh, previously, we were talking to some of your um, other colleagues and stuff. I didn't realise how lucky I was. Yeah, I'm, I work for a brilliant brand in an industry that I've always loved. Um, and I have a fabulous team. And in the last couple of years, I guess that's all you could ask for, really. So, yeah, no, I yeah. think you're probably absolutely spot on. Very good. Well, uh, yeah, build, building on it, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background for those that those listeners that maybe don't know you. So um, I've been here at Waitrose for 11 years, but doing a variety of roles. But primarily, uh, previously to that, I spent a decade at PepsiCo. So learning wow. my FMCG stripes, if you like, working on brands like Walker's Crisps. Um, private, previously to that, I my first ever job actually was at Nestle as a graduate uh, on Smarties. And there's no better way to start than a tube of lovely uh, chocolate sweets. So I've always been um, in the food industry, even as a consultant, most of my time was spent working with other food organisations. Um, it's fast moving, it's innovative, it's interesting. It's the kind of stuff you can have a conversation with your family with over the dinner table. So yeah, uh, yeah it's always been my passion. Very good, very good. Um, so to start the um, every podcast episode, we we like to do some kind of rapid fire questions just so the listeners can kind of understand a bit more about you. So uh, let's start with your, um, your your favorite town or city in the UK for for food from from an eating out perspective, I guess. So I'm really lucky I'm not far from London, um, uh -huh. but actually um, I have to say Glasgow. I was up in on holiday in Scotland last year, and I was really impressed by um, the variety of food they've got. But I was lucky enough to eat right. at Carl Bruch uh, and Unilome, I think, who's recently got a Michelin star. So I think they were much more adventurous, um, and there were some great conversations around the food as well. So I would say if you're going to do a foodie trawl, try. We well, can do two in one, Glasgow and Edinburgh, but I definitely give Glasgow. Right, interesting. Okay, no, very good. Um, and then, what, what would your what would your final meal be? And we'll limit it to three courses, ideally not a ten course taster. <laughs> um, it's it's really easy. It would be um, Thai vegetable red curry with mango sticky rice. That's it. Oh, very good. Very yeah, good. I absolutely <laughs> adore the food of Thailand. I was lucky enough to live there for a couple of years. But a, a an amazing a mango sticky rice when mangoes in season you just cannot beat it. Yeah, well, I'm not a mango uh, yeah. person, but uh, I'd happily have my final meal with that one. No, there's no hesitation there at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what, what what I presume um, your young people kind of ask you similar questions quite a lot outside of outside of work. What would you say to someone looking to get into the uh, the food industry, either just generically or into into product development? Um. I, th I think it's a great place to work. I think there's huge amounts of opportunity. So, I mean, my kids are, are just thinking about the A-levels and universities right now. And right. I would say at that stage, just do what you love because you will find a career that meets it. And actually quite a lot of careers don't even exist uh, right now that those guys will go on to have. Sure. But if you go on to university and you do something that you're absolutely passionate about, I don't think it matters, actually. Not everybody has to have the same career path into food off, um, afterwards. So we've got trained lawyers. We've got food nutritionists. Um, what we've got is a passionate bunch of clever people who can apply their minds to customer problems. So um, I wouldn't specialise too early would probably be my advice. Okay. Uh, and then get some experience, whether that's you know waitressing, being near kitchens or getting into offices, product testing, uh, the holidays, that kind of stuff, just so you can see the breadth of what's available. But I don't think people have got a great awareness of exactly all the different types of jobs that you can do. So if right. you know you love food and you've got a great consumer mind and you can see opportunities, then, um, yeah, practice what you love and then find a job that you you, you fall into. So right. I was lucky enough, I did a management science degree. I didn't specialise in anything 
I work for a number of brilliant brands um, as a graduate. So as I said, Nestle and, and PepsiCo. So I sort of fell into the food world. But once I fell into it, it's it's huge. Manufacturing, retailing, own brand, um, et cetera. So uh, technology, food technology is a huge one going forward. So, you know, yeah. even whether you're science-based or management-based, I think it really doesn't matter. But um, yeah. yeah, I think it's it's one of those that's continually progressing and it's a big enough industry that there's always a lot of churn and, and newness. So you can't get stuck in a job for too long. I think if if you do a very um, small kind of sphere of influence role or a specialist role, you can end up doing the same thing quite regularly all the time. Whereas in food, it's different from week to week. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and then finally, if, if you hadn't have landed in the food industry early in your career, do you, do you have a, where else would you have loved to spend your career, do you think? So this is one that makes my kids laugh. So I would love to have been a weather girl. Um, I, which is really weird. Awesome. I love geography at school right. and I don't live far from the European weather station. In fact, in Bracknell used to be the home of um, the weather stations here in the UK. Right. Um, I remember looking at Michael Fish uh, telling us there was a storm coming in the 80s that took down lots of trees and stuff <laughs> and thinking, oh, he's so clever. I just, um, yeah, the weather has always fascinated me. So I... Um, yeah, I, I had a go. We were up at the BBC studios in Salford recently and I had a go at presenting yeah. the weather. It was, it was the best. Yeah, weather oh, girl. Cool. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, OK, right. We're going to move on to the, um, the, the, the industry section, I guess, of the, uh, of, of the podcast. So we're going to delve into the world of products uh, innovation within consumer goods, try and maybe pick apart some of the things that we think it could uh, potentially do better and, and try and look at what, you know, what, what it could look, look like in five years uh, from now. So I, I, I kind of an opening question that I have used a couple of, of, of times. If you had to score the, the UK uh, food and drink innovation sector for, I guess, for impact, uh, what, what marks out of 10 would you give it and, and why? Probably a seven out of 10, because I think we're quite hard on ourselves in the industry when we look at, you know, the success levels of innovation in particular. Um, but the food industry in a whole kept food on the shelves in the last couple of years. And um, that's that takes a lot of doing. Um, there's always things that you can do better. I don't think we've particularly as an industry worked fast enough in um, in the health sphere. I think we've been a little yeah. bit slow. So I'm really pleased to see the amount of kind of Veg vegan innovation has massively taken off in the last 18 months, but yeah. we were probably too slow in there. And there's lots of things we can do as food as medicine. So, but generally, I think in terms of keeping people satisfied through good food, we've done a reasonable, we've done a reasonable job. Okay, interesting. You, mean, you mentioned the the, um, the 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 plant-based sector. I, I find that really interesting. I, I find that they're doing stuff from an R and D perspective that maybe the rest of the food industry uh, isn't. Do you think there's stuff that the other other kind of verticals could learn from from plant based at the moment. Yeah, most definitely. So we haven't we haven't had to evolve texture and flavour in the non um, veg and vegan space uh, space at all because it's all delivered through the you know the meat context etc. So they've had to work very hard to deliver something that's as good as eating meat because there is a group of customers that are looking for that and they've yeah. done it through innovation. Um, so people like the veg butcher you know, creating stuff, you know, it was being created in a lab before it ever saw anything, you know, come to life in terms of product. Yeah. So I think they've been much more innovative in overcoming some of the hurdles to their product types than the rest of us have been where we've done it through different ingredients and flavor combinations and mouthfeel, etc. But using the toolkit that we've always had, I think going forward, we're going to have to play in that game, probably to meet some of the hurdles on HFSS in terms of sugar and salt replacers. And I, I think there are areas where we've probably been too slow to react because there's been too many other ways of getting around it, if you like, whereas right. the non industry have had to overcome a massive barrier to purchase and, and they've gone and invested and, um, you know, moving mountains, burgers and stuff look and feel like a meat burger. Um, yeah. I think the States have been doing a relatively good job for a much longer period than we have, but we've been slightly slow to adopt some of that stuff, but also right. invest in technology. You know, we've been sweating assets, both as retailers and as manufacturers, the assets that we've got, because it's been a difficult two or three years for investment. So I think now is, is probably the time to refocus those investments more in technological advances, yeah. most definitely. Yeah, for sure. And, and from what I, I read about that, that sector, there are some manufacturers making some quite big bets about uh, manufacturing process and 
capability that's highly kind of technology led that probably won't come to fruition for another five maybe even yeah. uh, 10 years which is yeah but again is, is different to what you what, what certainly what i see across a lot of the industry so, I mean, vertical farming is another good example. It's still relatively small scale. But if you think about, you know, how much of our produce we could make at home and to reduce carbon footprint, but also improve food security with everything that's going on in the war in Ukraine, etc. Vertical farming offers quite big opportunities, but it takes yeah. huge upfront investment. And, you know, all of our systems are set up to grow our lettuce in Spain, as an example. So there are there are big technological advances and there are big distribution and, and system changes that would be required for us to, to get to these things at scale. And, and so they're in the difficult box right now. But I think there'll be external pressures, which mean we have to do a lot more of that stuff in the future. Yeah. OK. Um, and then just look, looking across the, the the market as a whole, what what area do you think that the the innovation sector could could do a little better? I guess when it comes to, you know, launching really high impact kind of uh, products in, in in an efficient way. Um, I I think we still, I don't think we do a great job on packaging. To be perfectly honest, I think okay. quite often the products are good, and you know we'll we'll put them in a pack that will go on a shelf and it will sell. But I don't think we're necessarily being as innovative in the packaging arena as we are in the product that goes into it. Right. Um, okay. So again, you know there are impacts on carbon, but reducing plastics, etc. We end up doing it through a necessity, particularly when plastic costs are going up but not necessarily through transforming the customer experience through some more interesting, innovative packaging. So I think that's right. that's where we um, we need to focus because it, it's a holistic experience for the customer. Uh, yeah. And we're doing 80% of the job and, and we're still thinking, particularly as retailers, of a, a piece of packaging as a selling face for the customer to get all of our messages onto rather than using that packaging structure to do something else as part of that customer experience. So right, return okay. is a good example um where people would buy into something and then bring it back and use it again and creating a whole new system so i th i think we've relied too heavily again on on the the machines that erect the current cartons that put your ready meal in a box sure. that, that give a, a decent um selling face because actually there are there are issues with moving away from that in terms of how you get impact for the customer at the shelf but there are also big cost implications in how you change packaging lines for example so again i yeah. think that's probably where the next 18 months i don't think it's longer than that we've got to step change right interesting yeah that's maybe i think that could be a future podcast episode actually trying to look at maybe a couple of different other other sectors that, that do that kind of packaging within the product proposition quite quite well yeah that's really interesting um Reflecting back over your your, your time uh, in the consumer goods sector, you've obviously had a you know a, a, a good period of time within what I would term kind of CPG, so the, the big branded, often global manufacturers, so you know PepsiCo, um, and then you obviously had you know a number of years in in, in retail and waitrose. What 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 are the kind of the big differences in terms of how those two sectors approach innovation? Sheer scale. So I would say uh, I thought. I thought PepsiCo was a fast moving, and it is, it was 10 years ago, a fast moving consumer goods operation. But the amount of NPD that we launched in a year was peanuts compared to what retailers churn out. So right. I think, uh, I think processes are similar in terms of going through stage gate processes and sign offs. I think within manufacturing, you own the manufacturing relationship. So you can be on site changing stuff talking to the factory manager and stuff, that's a little bit more removed when you're a retailer because you're using that for a supply base. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think in, innovation can be more efficiently delivered in the manufacturing base than it can as a retailer. Um, but the sheer volume of what we churn through because of the sheer number of different uh, supply base that we work with is on off a different scale. So right. um, we have a team of people who just manage the timelines, the planning process of getting an idea from a sketch on a piece of paper to a shelf. Uh, in PepsiCo, that was much more straightforward, much more lean, and you relied much more on the systems to do that because there, there was just fewer amounts of it going through. But then they had a bigger impact. Um, so, you know, I was... When I was there, we launched great British flavoured Walker's crisps. So Marmite, a Heinz tomato ketchup and a Branston pickle. Um, right. And 
that was the biggest thing we did that year. It came with a massive TV campaign, a huge trade plan campaign, but everything that you work on is up, up to the point of purchase. You then hand it on to somebody else to execute on your behalf. Whereas in retail, you've got that final mile. Where's it going to go on the shelf? How are you going to um, get partners in branches to talk about it and, and you know excite customers, yeah. etc. So the kind of what you do in your role as an innovator is quite different between the two as well. Right. Okay. Both equally interesting, um, yeah. but I think I wasn't prepared for the scale of change uh, the, right. and the speed of, of getting things done. And it's and it's incredibly competitive. I mean, you know, there's a very um, established retailer market here in the UK who are all busy yeah. doing what we're doing. And so you're constantly looking over your shoulder, whereas if you are the number one brand in that market, you're much more likely to be leading that market rather than and looking to globally what's going on rather than being so um, focused on what's going on in the UK. Yeah, true. Right. OK. And and how has innovation process changed over your time at, uh, at Waitrose? I mean, the demands for it to be faster keep coming. Right. Uh, okay. I think I think I think the systems are there. I don't I don't think they're as good as they could be and I'm sure everybody would say that about their innovation processes you know the, the creative bit is the bit that we all get out of bed for in the mornings developing those products or the yep. packaging design or whatever it happens to be but landing something on shelf is so complicated involves so many different people the process is probably the bit that gets everybody bogged down so I wish there was a magic button that just made all that stuff kind of happen and maybe one day there will be um, but in the meantime, I think it's a necessity of landing things right first time. I think the pressure on return on investment is um, is increasing and will continue to increase. Okay. You can't keep launching the amount of, and not just Waitrose, the industry launches um, without, I think, being, with the amount of data that we've now got our fingertips, the amount of testing that we can do and stuff up front without increasing your return on investment and therefore being much more thoughtful so i'm hoping that the funnel will narrow and we'll have fewer but bigger wins um but i think we're a little bit away from that because the market just changes underneath your feet so you yeah. know this time last year we weren't prepared for wheat prices up where they are packaging prices up where they are in a cost of living crisis that, that people would be facing into the summer we were hoping this was going to be well, a summer festival, that's what you can see if you walk into Waitrose yeah, right. right because nobody travelled for a couple of years and this is going to be the big year of the big escape. So um, I think that demand for being agile and constantly updating and changing will continue, but there will be much, much more pressure on return and investment because we've sweated the assets that we've got. If you're going to make investments now, you've got to be absolutely bulletproof that they will return. So you mentioned ROI. So how, how do you kind of coach your 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 teams to to manage uh, or understand the level of, of risk within individual products? I guess that they're kind of coming to you and proposing for for launch. So I mean, we we do the the sort of normal analysis on the shape of the market, who the customers are, what penetration yeah. it will drive, what rate of sale, etc. But we've we've put to mitigate some of the risk, we've put a big emphasis up on um, investigate. So we we right. use a language in Waitrose called the Six Eyes, um, oh. and we um, we did a kind of review and understood that actually we weren't putting enough effort into the investigation up front. So the scene setting, the understanding the scale of the risk and the return required but also on the um, evaluating at the end of the process to make sure that you're constantly improving. We were right. launching and leaving to a certain extent um, just because of the speed of what we were doing. So, yeah, much more upfront testing of concept ideas, of packaging ideas in particular, so that it, it lands right first time. And then a huge focus this year for my team on that kind of the final 90 day review and sharing those learnings back so we don't make the same mistakes twice. Right. Um, okay. It's not rocket science, but it's again, it's not the creative, sexy part of the job. Um, but I've seen a step change in the um, upfront testing of ideas. So when things get presented to us at panel, there'll be data that tells you that, you know, the national um, sample of the UK think this, the Waitrose sample think why we think yeah. by doing this bit here, we can improve our penetration by a couple of points, etc. So it's right. definitely being used in kind of selling in the ideas to the business. But the final, the final piece will always be, is it commercially viable and is it worthy of putting our name on the packet? And so that's right. those kind of standards of um, signing things off won't ever change. But I think we're coming out to it with much more data than we've ever done before.
Right, okay, that's interesting. Um, and then you, you touched on it briefly a moment ago, you and I were talking about it before we, we, we started this this episode, the, the, the cost of living crisis is going to, looks like it's going to be with us for at least a year, I guess. How do you think that's likely to impact product innovation, not, not just in Waitrose, but across the, the, the UK market for the next 12 months? It's interesting because COVID massively suppressed innovation. Uh, I mean, right. very little happened in the last couple of years because it was the pipeline that got shut down and, and furloughed within manufacturing and not so much within where we are. Uh, so we've seen a huge uptick this year in things that are launching to the market. So I think there is a, a backlog of innovation that people will want to get out, will have invested in. So I'm not yep. sure it will slow down. I do think the emphasis or the timing of things will change. So the cost of living crisis for every customer means they are watching the pennies. Uh, and we've looked sure. back at the 2008 kind of customer behaviours and what happened in the last recession and a couple of things, people tended to eat in more rather than eat out. So mm -hmm. um, that's a kind of a share of stomach opportunity for us as an industry. People right. use up stuff a lot more. So kind of decreasing food waste, but making sure meals can go further. So actually that's really useful for scratch cooks and how you might be able to capitalize on that kind of market. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing is, is the value of the basket. So, you know, how much are you getting for how much and, and how much do you value that? So um, making sure that you can communicate value that isn't just the price on the shelf, but is what you're buying into. So for us, our animal welfare standards, they will not change even in a recession. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That's how we do it. But we need to be much better in how we communicate that to a customer. So if they care about that, yeah. um, they can make a kind of a, a judgment on how much it's worth to invest in a steak or a, a packet of mints. Um, so I, I think it's how you communicate value in all of its forms is going to be um, what will make innovation successful the next couple of years. It's probably not how a lot of it was devised, but even now you see right. people kind of fine tuning um, their communication stances at the moment so that customers are getting the value message of whatever it is that you're trying to sell. So yeah. it may be that the premium end, some of the premium end of the market within food and drink, I imagine may get a little bit delayed because you're not going to have 20 quid for a, an interesting new spirit uh, left over at the end of the week in the way that you might have envisaged this year. I, right. I don't think it will slow down a huge amount because I think commitments will already be made. I think we'll probably yeah. see a big impact this time next year. Right. Okay. Okay. So let, let's just turn our attention to the future of, of innovation for a moment. And obviously, you know, we, we, we do seem to be kind of lurching from economic crisis to economic crisis. So it's very hard to kind of um, predict for with any accuracy. But let's just think what what innovation in a, in a large retailer like Waitrose could look like in, in, in five years time um, from a structure perspective in terms of how you're thinking about structuring your, your teams what, what what do you think is the kind of the, the direction of travel at the moment um I'm not sure that's going to change that much we have a, a pod structure here so we have teams right. that work collaboratively across buying technical and product development but actually much broader than that merchandising supply chain planning etc cetera, etc cetera. That's a change that we made about three years ago. Um, and that collaborative working when it works well is the most cost effective way of launching a product and, and making it successful because you've got the great thinking coming from all parts of the business who all believe in what it is that you're trying, trying to launch. Okay. So I don't think the structure is necessarily going to change. I think um, we've got to be really conscious that what we do is competing with brands. Um, so actually being part of that wider conversation that what a customer is seeing is really important rather than being isolated in your own brand world, I think is really important. So, right. um, I, yeah, I, I think there's going to be a lot more structure. I, I think the, the issue at the moment is, you know, there's cost price increases all coming across the industry, um, that there's a huge amount that our teams are having to deal with on a daily basis. So trying to remove cost of goods. Um, trying to find new distribution routes across Europe and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's, it's hard whilst you've got a lovely collaborative group to make sure that innovation remains the focus within that group. That's probably the biggest challenge in the next 12 months, just because of everything else that's hitting them on a daily basis. But right, okay. I, yeah, I'm not envisaging anything massively changing from a structure perspective. And just just build a little on that pod, pod structure because you know you, you you guys have been doing it for a number of years. It's not necessarily something that other retailers outside of food and drink would would uh, would, would do. So that when when you say cross functional, that's not just 
product development people that's you've got what buying merchandising supply chain etc just talk to me a little about how how they, those work yeah so the idea behind it was that the people who know the category the best are the people who live and breathe it day to day so yeah. actually developing for that category your best place if you know what the kind of average rates of sale are you know what's going on in the wider category from a branded unknown brand perspective um you're getting feedback from the merchandising teams on what the packaging is is working on shelf and the heights etc cetera, etc cetera. so the team work collaboratively on because a product developer alone cannot land a product they need their technical support right. and they need their buying their, their buyers in there and i think it's it when it works and it doesn't always work but it, I, I think nine times out of ten it does you just see a better where much more well-rounded well-considered proposition coming by the time i see it at a panel um if the the team have all bought in they, they've had the difficult discussions on how much cheese are you putting on the top of that lasagna because that negotiation yeah. would happen between the product developer based on what they think from a taste perspective what the supplier can dose onto that thing and what we can afford from a, a, um, a margin point of view. All of those difficult conversations in constructing product have happened by the time it gets to us. Um, and therefore, it's, it's really likely to be have been constructed in a way that will win on the shelf uh, right. in a long term way, rather than launching something that might be brilliant from a customer point of view, but the margin and the distribution channels and where it has to sit just doesn't work from a, a kind of a um merchandising and, and branch distribution point of view we have these conversations quite often at christmas when we're developing beautiful desserts or, or chocolates that are incredibly delicate um you can't just put please be careful on a case when it goes into a branch you right. have to understand the rigor that that product will go through in that final you know five meters of getting on the shelf and make sure you've considered everything that you possibly can yeah for that brilliant product to reach the customer as you intended so i think it's had a better impact on product um, briefing working collaboratively collaboratively up front on what it needs to achieve and, and how it needs to perform through the supply chain than if when the, the PDs were, and technical teams were working on their own. So we're seeing better success rates. We're also getting okay. better buy-in because people are working on right. common objectives and therefore everyone's got a bit more skin in the game to make it, to, to make products stick. And and that's okay. that's where you get your return on investment. It's not in the first 90 days, it's in the first you know three years. Um, right. So yeah, I, I think it's definitely working. I think it's going to get broader. So the more you know, collaborative you can be across other channels that need to deliver things to market. But the the kind of core, if you like, are the buyer, the technical person, and the product developer. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, and and let's just think about process for for a minute. Staging gate has been certainly you know kind of five or ten years ago was pretty much the default across most uh, most retailers. And and, and, I, and I think fundamentally, still many elements of that. Are there now how, how do you think process is likely to involve uh, likely to evolve across uh, retail over the coming three to five years um i mean it's got to automate it has to i think stage gate works when you've got um a certain volume i think the minute you start getting huge amounts of volume it becomes a thing on its own to try and manage and you get as i said earlier you get bogged down in admin i hope that we develop processes that are automated in a way so you know a barcode will automatically be um, generated and applied to a piece of packaging because something further upstream right. has triggered that rather than people having to still do the individual steps. I think the stage gate process of ideating, checking in to make sure something's worth doing, going through the development, signing off the product, launching it, and then review it. In principle, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the sheer complexity of the bits in between that are the treacle. Okay. And that's what I would like to see streamlined through technology in the next, um, well, as soon as possible. We're having conversations now about, you know, what can we learn from other people in other industries about streamlining our processes um, and pulling all the data into one place that so can kind of all shoot in different directions when it needs to do. So that would take a huge amount of burden out of the system and allow us to be faster to market, which in, in hopefully will mean we deliver more revenue. So um, okay. I think that's probably the, rather than a structure process, structure process is going to be where the investment in thinking time and probably money is going to have to be in the next 12 months. Right, okay. And, and do you think uh, expectations about um, product innovation are likely to fundamentally shift in terms of, you know, l l launching for ever, ever lower kind of um, 
costs and 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 reducing the failure rates down to zero do you, do you think that's you know that that's going to shift fundamentally uh i think it'll have to particularly if you're making big investments or you're asking a supply base to make big investments you've got to be really sure on on your returns um yeah. my worry is getting down to zero wouldn't that be a nice place to be from my perspective i don't think it would because that means <clears> that you're you're iterating you're probably not being breakthrough and actually right. nobody true innovation is getting people to um to buy into something they just never knew that they really needed and so my my worry on just focusing on return on investment will mean that you will iterate more and more and you'll have more and more brand extensions or flavor <clears> extensions <throat> that's not that's not real breakthrough innovation we make the big breakthrough and we make the big slightly more risky bets yeah um, so as an innovator, I hope we don't get to 0%. I'd like okay. to get better than where we are today. Um, but I think you have to be prepared um, to move markets on. You know, the, the plant-based people weren't sitting there five years ago. If, if they were more measuring their innovation based on, you know, medium terms, return on investment, they'd never have launched Veg Butcher or whatever it happened to be. True. So yeah. I, I think there's a very fine balance um, to play. Um, but you also have to have some wins under your belt. So you can be a little yeah. bit more risky when you've got a few more wins. So um, yeah, I, I really worry that it becomes a return on investment only because customers shop um, with their hearts and their minds as well as their pockets. Mm -hmm. And so we measure um, net promoter scores as an important part of how we measure success, not just kind of money through the tills. Um, we want people to choose to come to Waitrose for our own brand as much as they do for the brands um and therefore and getting things from us that they can't get from anybody else and that means we're going to have to be more innovative and more unique for that group of customers otherwise what's the reason to come across the road and shop with us um right. it becomes a, a sort of diminishing return so it's a fine balance okay so d d definitely some acceptance of, uh, of of failure i guess would be you know what one of the things that the innovation sector has to has to live with to get those big bits uh right well on that note you know any kind of um, product launches that have, have disappointed that the failure failure word is often misconstrued at times but in any kind of failures over the last two years within uh, within waitrose and what, what did you learn uh from it moving forwards yeah i was um i was thinking on that actually because we kept going in covid uh with our innovation plan so last year we launched levantine table which is our middle eastern range yeah um, and we've just won the Grocer Gold Own Label Range of the Year. Award right, yeah, sure. We're incredibly proud. So actually, yeah, we took we took what was a pretty big risk actually for us as a, a food um, grocer in that time. And part of it was a lot of the work and a lot of the thinking we're doing, we just needed to get it over the final line in COVID. So I think for us in the last couple of years, there haven't been... Um, we, we haven't necessarily seen failures in the product that we've launched. Mm -hmm. I would say, however, what, what we haven't done as much as we should have done is because of COVID and working from home, we became much more too much internally focused, internally focused in our industry, but also not getting out to see what's going on in the rest of the market. So I think the hard work is happening, has had to happen now to make sure the innovation of the future is as broad and as appealing as some of the stuff that we've previously launched because you couldn't go on market trawls at cr last christmas because of, of sure. covid yeah. you couldn't get out and experience that bright new restaurant because it probably wasn't opening and if it was uh, you know it was shut due to covid so i think the bit that we've got the failure if you like from an innovation team i would say is becoming too insular as a result of covid and not taking okay. those chuckles off quick enough to be creative innovators as we've come out of the pandemic. Um, and so getting people out and about, getting people out doing visits, getting people into branches, getting people into the supply base, all of that is incredibly important, but it took a while for us to ramp back up again. Um, and with hindsight, we probably should have done that faster. But I think people okay. were naturally nervous. As human beings, sure. we've all been naturally nervous about what's going on and now we're learning to live with COVID. It's kind of yet another day. So. Um, yeah, it's pushing ourselves to be okay. as innovative as we would have once been pre-COVID and not to just think about the world in the four room, the four walls that we happen to be sitting in on our own some okay. right now. So now, now that you, you are out kind of looking at the rest of the market outside of Waitrose, what, what's the best either products launch or, or range that you've seen uh, over the last couple of years? So, because uh, I knew you were going to ask me this, I went and did a bit of a trawl last night of uh, the competitive <laughs> uh, set and 
there there's been there has been a lot of brand extension i would say um which is novel, but not particularly breakthrough. Okay. Uh, I was a bit underwhelmed, which sounds awful. Um, but the one product I did pick up, and I've got it here because I bought it for my lunch, actually. And it, it's probably, right. I guess, um, it's more about what this represents. But I think the veg and vegan market have been much more innovative in the last two years in terms yeah. of turning vegetarian food to be as interesting and tasty as a meat alternative so that meat eaters automatically move into that sector and nudged into that sector rather than being full-blown veggies that's probably the biggest thing ball is one good example yeah. of that there have been there have been many more and i think um all of the own brand retailers have massively upped their game in the veg and vegan space so as a sector i think that's been the most innovative over the last couple of years making non-meat eating just part of everyday life and i think the um credit crisis will have another impact on that i think people from an affordability point of view will automatically start to turn to more interesting vegetarian food probably from scratch rather than process but yeah so that's an area that i think's done particularly well um right. yeah the rest of it has been a little bit lackluster i would say okay, <laughs> okay. That's kind of awful, isn't it? marking our own homework <laughs> Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm a big fan of the plant-based sector. I think they've got a very interesting tipping point coming up where these alternative proteins at the point that the, the, the taste and the texture is either similar or better than the meat and the, and the cost yeah. and the price is either the same or lower than the meat. I think that we will see a very significant shift in consumer behavior and that, that could be quite soon. And there's, and I mean, there's a group of consumers who've been thinking like that for a long time, the younger generation who are yeah. much more likely to be vegetarian or, or vegan from a climate point of view as much as a cost point of view, but it just, it'll just go hand in hand. So um, we were just, you know, chatting as a, an innovation team last week, the number of people, Meat Free Monday is just normal now. It's normal in yeah. schools, it's normal in homes. You wouldn't have said that five years ago. So I think it will, I think it will continue to grow not just the plant proteins, but doing interesting stuff with veg, which again is just fundamentally healthy and good for you. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that meat isn't, um, but I think from a value point of view, that's where we're gonna see a lot of the growth in the next six months, definitely. Um, and then we're, we're coming to a close, just the, 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 the final topic, just kind of touching on what, what we mentioned right at the start of the uh, the, the episode, just in terms of innovation as a, as a career, for, you know, we, we talked about kind of young people coming into it. What 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 are the skill sets that you think that that make successful product innovators, product uh, product developers? What do you what do you like to see in people uh, within your within your teams that you think will make them successful? I mean, the first thing is a passion for the customer um, right. and a curiosity uh, because you can't train that. I think you've got to you've got to be able you've got to love whatever the industry is you is and, and for us it's food but you've got to be curious about what the customers want need desire and have a passion to go and create it um i think things like being commercially astute as a product developer now you need to be much more commercially aware um than probably you did 15 years ago just because of you know as we talked about the return on investment pressures and margin pressures but yeah. you can train some of that kind of stuff and you can be supported through that if you're working with your buying teams um i think you have to be great at analyzing data because we've probably got more of it now than we've ever had before so whether it's uh, loyalty card data whether it's using services like yours on testing um Kantar, IRI, Mintel, there's so much out there. It's about picking out the right fragments of insight that will help you build a customer winning proposition. So right. analytical skills, um, which is quite is can be quite at odds sometimes with cre massively creative people, but I think or people think that's the case. It's not about being brilliant at maths, it's being analytical with with data, however that data is presented to you. Yeah. Um, and then the the one thing I would say that I wish I'd done earlier in my career was um, learn to negotiate. Um, right. And that's not necessarily a selling negotiation, but a negotiation so you get what you want and what's the best overall outcome for your product. Like I was talking earlier about the amount of cheese on a lasagna. That's a negotiation to be had with the supplier, with the technical manager, with the buyer. Um, right. And I think there's going to be a lot more negotiation skills required to land brilliant innovation going forward just because of the sheer number of people you have to work alongside and collaborate with to get something good on the shelf so um right. that they would be my analytics negotiation 
but you can't teach the passion. You've got to be, you've got to have that, that want and that desire and that forward looking um, perspective. And what, what do you think is the, the, the one thing that the innovation <clears throat> sector does, does amazingly well that's not necessarily kind of understood externally either within the kind of the broader market or by, by consumers? Yeah, I, th I think we understand a lot more about human psychology than people would think we do. So, you know, we right. we consider what a customer will see, what the customer will think and how they will feel based on a piece of packaging or a product or wherever it happens to be. And I'm not sure people realise how much depth of thought goes into um, creating a product. I was reflecting on the communications around COVID in the last couple of years, you know, the the way because at the beginning they were so effective is because somebody understood the human psychology of what it would take to switch us on to behaving in the way that the government wants us to, us to behave yeah. and marketeers and product developers and packaging developers do that every day thinking about the language they might use or the um, the color schemes or the flavor profiles that will will have an impact on human psychology but um yeah, I'm not sure people ever realise quite the depth of understanding a customer that we will go to to create something that they truly will desire and and pick up. Right. Yeah, it's, it's quite deep levels of empathy, isn't it? I think that's required yeah. to kind of yeah. really land innovation. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, we, uh, we've we've come to a close. Um, Emma, it's been fascinating talking to you. Um, many thanks for giving up your time. You're um, very welcome. And yeah, I, I look forward to continuing the conversation at a future date. Uh, Emma Bill, Head of Products Innovation at Waitrose, thank you very much for your time uh, on the Innovate podcast. Thanks.